Hey, listen up. Yeah, we here and we locked in. Let's keep it going all the way to the top ten. We fear the turtle, so it's no other option. Fred and Ryan, just watch them. Let's take it to the max. It's the shell and tell. They come with all the facts. It's the shell and tell. Let's take it to the max. It's the shell and tell. They come with all the facts. It's the shell and tell. What's up, Turf fans? Fred and Ryan back for another episode of the Shell and Tell podcast. It's April 19th, and this is a special edition. This is a uh, a new extension to the show. Ryan and I have talked about doing different segments of the show, and this is a new segment we're calling Player Spotlight. Yeah, we've had a few players in the past. You know, we had Mr. Ellis McKinney, of course. We had Dino, Dino Tomlin on. Um, but as this becomes more of a regularity and not like, oh, my God, this is the only interview we're ever going to have, we thought it'd be nice to... <laughs> segment it off because these things are going to be relevant for years to come things people would want to go back and listen to and to have a different segment title will help with that exactly and this gives fans an inside perspective on our athletes our student athletes as more than just the athlete that they are on more of a personal level uh and we're super excited to have our first player spotlight this week Mr. Anthony Pecorella. yeah really excited to have Anthony Pecorella on the team we, we've become kind of the uh offensive lineman specialist podcast around here we got we got don't Anthony. pigeonhole us like that right <laughs> hey we, we enjoy all of it we've really gotten to get to know some of these players on a, on a personal basis and that's why we wanted to bring this to you guys is a lot of times these interviews have not ended or started with you guys listening we're talking for months beforehand and we ch check in with them about every month afterwards so it's been really fun as a fan to be able to do that i wanted to give you guys more of an insight into who these players are and hopefully we'll continue to have that opportunity anthony was the starting punter last year he's a junior um comes in at 6 3 2 10 uh last year he played in all the games totaled 15 punts for 631 yards had a long of 55 yards and this is the most important one eight pin punts inside the 20 yard line so he is a true weapon obviously we have some competition in our last interview a uh, player coming in next year right but It'll be fun to watch these two battle it out leg for leg. Anthony did a great job last year of really solidifying that special teams core. And uh, we couldn't be more excited to have him on the show. So without further ado, let's bring Anthony in. Anthony, can't thank you enough for taking time to sit down with us today, man. It means a lot to us. Great to be here. Thank you for having me. I yeah, think no the problem. fans, I think the fans really got to know how this got started, man. As you know, the Maryland Terrapins podcast, we follow pretty much all the players. <laughs> But there's something special about a punter with some swagger that likes to talk a lot. Right. <laughs> so I've always been a big fan of Mr. Anthony Pecorello. We, we've talked back and forth. And then I saw him tweet that he was real disappointed that Dino Tomlin got on before he had, did. <laughs> now, little did he know, we were nothing. That Dino Tomlin was our very first episode. We reached yeah. out to anybody and everybody that would be on the show. And Dino was the first one to bite. I was very happy to have him. I couldn't believe it happened. But uh, that's that's how that went down. I said, well, you know, you're welcome anytime, Anthony. And so we worked this out. Yes, sir. Yeah. It's awesome. So what we like to do uh, in our quote unquote player spotlight interviews is to kind of give the fans of the program a little inside look at you as a person, not not just the athlete. Right. So mm -hmm. it's, it's a little bit all about you. Um, so so let's start with learning a little bit how you got to Maryland. Good. Right. Yeah, I see that your hometown list is Malvern, New York. However, I see on your 247's uh, profile that you were highly can concentrated on the old ACC. I see Maryland, Boston College, Duke, Wake Forest, all listed in your schools. What was the ACC connection? Because I'm not seeing it. So it wasn't most, it wasn't really an ACC connection. It was more of, I was looking at the best school where I can get both an education, a great education, and still play at a high level of football. And so I was trying to stay within three to four hours. So Duke and Duke and Wake Forest were a little out of the way, but they're both great schools academically. Yeah. So I looked at them very in the beginning. And but Maryland was just one of those schools that it was four hours away, which wasn't too far. Great academics. I'm in the business school, so perfect fit. And it was just a home run. That's we're awesome. really glad to have you. I mean, I saw the other Big Ten school was Penn State. We're really glad you're playing for the good guys. <laughs> That's right. I'm glad I'm, I'm glad I'm playing for the good guys too. That's right. You made the right decision. So going back to your high school days, um, were you strictly a specialist in high school, or did you play any other positions, or what? 
So I played I played quarterback in high school too, and I miss it a lot. Wow. Um, I was the quarterback, the kicker, and the punter in high school. And in fact, in high school, I was actually a better kicker than a punter. And it wasn't until Maryland started recruiting me when they said, you have the build of a punter and you should start taking punting more seriously. And I, I was like, yeah, yeah, if you want me here, yeah, I'll learn how to punt. I'll jump through a hoop, whatever you want me to do. I'll do it to get here. But, right. But yeah, in high school, I was, I, was, I was a kicker who could punt. Now I'm a punter who could kick. That's awesome. Did you play any other sports while you were in school or what? I played, I played not in, it was during my high school years. I played baseball and basketball. Nice. And then growing up, I played soccer too. That's awesome. Well-rounded athlete. That's great. Well, you kind of answered part of this question, next one, but as a preferred walk-on and a specialist, did you find yourself having to like self-promote to schools? Like some athletes use social media in order to be recruited or were you being sought after by programs? Obviously Maryland was coming after you. It was weird. In the beginning, it was very, very dry. There wasn't much conversation between me and schools. And I would post stuff on Twitter, but coming from where my high school was, I was actually the first Big Ten football player in my school's history. Oh, wow. And Long Island doesn't have too – Long Island doesn't get enough respect because there is a lot of talent that comes out of Long Island. Jeremy Rucker, who's at Ohio State. Right. Dan Valari, who's at Michigan. And – there's an offensive tackle at Northwestern. I'm forgetting his name, but there is a lot of talent. So I wasn't getting as much looks. So it wasn't really until I started going to college camps and putting my name out there. And they said, oh, this kid's pretty good. But as a preferred walk on, you kind of have to go in with the attitude of the lunch pail mentality where you're just going to work every day. You can't really do much complaining or I want this. I want that. You just say, yes, coach. Yes, coach. Yes, coach. Which you should always do regardless, but there's not much leeway you have. When in getting in, once you're in and establish yourself, then you could have a little more leeway in what you say and do, kind of thing. Got it. Yeah, a couple of things that are interesting there. So, uh, your your Twitter, uh, you don't fly under the radar any, obviously, as we discussed. <laughs> also, we're gonna have to edit out the fact that you're you were a high school quarterback, so nobody knows about this fake punt that's coming this year. That's no, right. Nobody knows. <laughs> nobody knows. Well, that's Ava. As a father of twins, I have to ask, I see that you have a twin sister. Was the college decision a family one? Were you looking for a school that you could attend together? Or was it just kind of someone that could bounce ideas off and talk things through? So when I committed to Maryland, my sister was between the two schools. She was between Providence in Rhode Island and Catholic in D.C. And she was like both very much. And we, I said to her, I said, don't lean towards one school or the other just because I'm going to Maryland and my sister, she does, she goes by the own beat of her drum. <laughs> no one, no one has to tell her, but she liked Catholic. It worked out perfectly. We're five, literally Baltimore Avenue, straight down Baltimore Avenue. I'm at her apartment. It's great. Cause me and my sister have been like this since we were kids. And yeah, it was good. It was, it was not much of a family decision. It was just, we kind of made our own decisions and it worked out perfectly. That's awesome. That's awesome. Speaking of family, football seems to run in the blood. I read that your father played for Hofstra. Yeah, and was, I've not, also was, heard, not a, was not a punter. Was not a punter. Or not a punter. No, what did he play? He played so in, in, in high school and college. He played tight end. At the end of his college career, he played middle linebacker. But he's actually in the semi-pro Hall of Fame as a right guard. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So well the opposite, complete opposite of me. Wow, that's impressive. Me. Yeah. <laughs> I also heard that your father and uncle played with a certain Maryland great. Tell the fans a little bit about that history. Boomer is science. And so when I first visited Maryland and I said I was from Long Island, they said, Do you know Boomer Science? Which they ask every Long Island kid that's in this I'm area sure. because, right. because Boomer's the greatest quarterback to come out of Long Island. So when I got here and I actually had a story where my uncle was the senior captain of the team when Boomer was a sophomore starter on the varsity. And he's actually my godfather, Joe Pecorella. And they were driving down EI, they went to East Islip High School. East Islip was driving down the score, and Boomer threw a pick in the end zone. And the coach was ready to, to kill him because he threw a pick in the end zone. And my uncle on the following drive picked it off and ran it back for a touchdown. And they won the game. And Boomer told my uncle, I'm forever in your debt. So anytime my uncle calls the fan, gets right on, no problem. Just says Joe Pecorella is just no problem. <laughs> That's awesome, man. That's really mm -hmm. awesome. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you mentioned your father. One of the one of my biggest support systems growing up for me through my life was my father. 
Uh, and I noticed over the last year or so, you use your Twitter platform not just for talking trash, but you use it for a lot of good, man, and helping bring awareness to mental health. Mm-hmm. Now, I've always been open about my my own personal struggles with anxiety and depression, as well as a support for the cause. And Ryan, obviously, working in the field as a psych nurse. A couple of things I respect so much about you talking about this is, one, obviously, the importance of using your platform for good. But two, is being so young and having the kind of understanding you have around it. See, me going through it, my struggles at 19, 20, when I was your age, I had no idea what was going on with me. Mm-hmm. I felt alone, and the terms anxiety and depression had like a stigma around them that you just didn't talk about it. Mm-hmm. So you being so self-aware and understanding the importance of talking about it speaks volumes, volumes of who you are as a person and your character. So if you don't mind telling the people why this cause is so close to you and to your heart. And it's kind of a shame that there is a stigma around it because everyone kind of thinks that people are supposed to be these perfect people, right? Then there's no other than Jesus Christ, there is no one that's perfect. And when they have these insecurities, they don't like people don't like sharing them because they don't like being vulnerable because they don't want people to look at them differently. And that was the biggest thing with me because I was always looked at as the happy go lucky kid, which I still am. There's not changed, but it's, it was just hard to come to the realization that I could share my feel, I could share what was going on in my head with the world and get such a, such open arm response from everyone in my family, my cousins, my mom, my dad, my sister, my grandmother. Uh, my, my friends actually at Maryland were actually angry with me because I didn't share with them sooner because they felt bad that they couldn't help me. But it's one of those things where, as you know, you kind of have to go through it on your own first. And then once you get a little bit of a grasp of it, you say, okay, I'm ready to get help. And once you get that help, and it's the biggest thing we preach. I actually run a mental health account, Healthy Minds on Instagram. And the biggest thing that me and my partner, Charlie Baker, preach is just finding that one person you could share your story with, just just vent to them kind of thing. Because that one talking to them goes so far. I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, my father was that person for me growing up. And when Mm -hmm. he passed a couple of years ago, I was blessed to have met Ryan and Ryan has become that, that person for me over the last few years. So a hundred percent agree with you. Uh, Do you have any future plans or like aspirations to kind of continue to bring this to the forefront and do good with this? Um, Well, the way we kind of look at it, me and Charlie and I is that just take it day by day and just try to help at least one person a day. Because if you start looking too far in the future, and then it turns more into a business. Then it turns into what we started to be is just to help at least one person a day. Right. So we just attack it as a day by day process and not as what we could grow it into kind of thing. Right. I could answer that any better. Yeah, that's amazing. I mean, and to use Instagram um, as a positive tool where I find that a lot of things we talked about, the stigma around things and why people feel so alone are the Instagrams and the Facebooks where you look and think everyone else's life's perfect. Because nobody's no, posting no, their nobody, negative. Nobody, because nobody <laughs> posts. Nobody posts their struggle. They post what they want you to see. Yeah, not exactly. What, they, not they what post. goes on behind. Like my grandmother, God rest her soul. All, all she used to say was, "You never know what goes beyond what goes on behind someone's four walls." And what happens behind someone's four walls is none of your business. But just know that the struggles you have in your household happen everywhere. It's not just your household. Not everyone else is out living the perfect life. Yeah, absolutely right. Well, like very well said. Well, let's dive into the football, man. A good place to start uh, mental side of football. How do you balance and deal uh, with the individuals we've been such a big weapon on the field and also knowing that none of us fans ever want to see you touch the grass on a Saturday? What is the <laughs> mental struggle of being a punter? <laughs> I'll tell you a funny story about that first. When we went to <laughs> Purdue my freshman year, the parents at Purdue – love my parents because when my parents showed up the tailgate the Purdue parents loved them when they said oh my son's the punter and they said oh we would love to see your son eight times <laughs> we would love to see him play uh it's kind of you kind of have to look at it as everyone has a job right whether it's a field goal kicker making th- making a field goal throwing a touchdown uh, making a sack everyone has a job and when when each individual person does their job correctly you're going to win the game so don't – I kind of look at it – my job as a punter is just do my job and we will win the game kind of thing. Not looking at it as, oh, I'm the punter, no one wants to see me kind of thing. Because yeah. I, mean, I kind of have a little fun with it because I'm a New Yorker and we got to bring <laughs> a little bit of attitude to everything we do. 
and added that I'm Italian is a whole nother thing. But, <laughs> but yeah, it, I'm I'm very guilty of the same thing. I'm I I don't know if you you're aware, but our sick seats are in section seven on the visitors sideline, four rows up, <laughs> and the best trash talk that you can do because it's yeah. not it's not mean, it's not an unfactual, it's just calling for punt team very loudly when it's third when it's third Ryan, down and not converted. Ryan's punt that team. guy. <laughs> Ryan's that guy that one week he got in a kicker's head so bad they had to move the kicking net to the other side of the field to get away from him. Like they that's did. Ryan. <laughs> yep. They had, the coach was talking to the kicker and like they pointed he pointed over to our section and then the coach went and grabbed two linemen who grabbed the kicking net and moved it to the other side of the stadium. <laughs> the best is, and I'm so, this is what I'm excited about is being back in stadiums and traveling all over the country. Wherever we travel, they fans in the stands, whether it was the student section or just the average fan would try and just have a conversation, not even just, not even trash talk, just have a conversation. Right. And that's what I'm most excited about just because the interaction it's just, it's it's what college football is all about, right? It's it's four years where you get to experience because not everyone goes to the NFL, but it's it's the closest thing without being the NFL that you get to experience that people look at you and say, "Wow, like this is a Division One athlete." I don't I don't feel like oh I'm this cool guy, but right. people look at you that way. And it it kind of gives you a good feeling. Kinda. Yeah, I've grown past sense. all the vulgarity of it and trying to really like yeah. You know, well, obviously, I'm a much older than these I kids mean, now. Do, I was do you. I was, but I mean, I was 14 <laughs> and 16. I really enjoyed that kind of stuff because these were like gods to me. I was like, oh my god, look at these football players. I can try to get that. And now I'm like, oh god, these are like some of these guys are just kids that are just trying to have a good time. Right. Like, sure, there's every weekend in the Big Ten, I see a NFL player out there at least, but a lot of them are just you know academic kids. Yeah. Right. Well, you mentioned getting back into the stands and playing in front of fans. Last year, you guys obviously missed out on a lot of the offseason training in person uh, due to the pandemic. What mm -hmm. do you feel is going to make the biggest difference for you this season that you didn't get to do last year? Um, Biggest difference. I would say for the team, we will be – a much tighter knit group because we've been through, this is my first spring. I've been here almost three, two years, two, I'll be finishing my second year this May, but it was my first spring ball. And just those 15 practices we didn't get last year. So that's a lot more reps game, like reps that I got that I feel will make me more comfortable when I'm on the field, but right. besides me, but just the team just firing on all cylinders in the spring now. So that by the fall comes, we're even better, which we didn't get to do last year. Right. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. Now that we are less than a week away from the spring game that they so rudely have locked me out of that stadium for so long, and I will be <laughs> sitting in Section 7, does <laughs> having the fans back have any extra hype for you? Maybe a sense of normalcy? A sense of normalcy, yes. Extra hype, yes, because it will be nice to see everyone in the stands. But the biggest thing, and they had some, some interview I did last year, uh, it was for a local newspaper back in Long Island. They asked, oh, is that going to affect you guys playing? And I said, no, because there's three people I play for in the stand, in, in the stadium, and I find them there in the, the section behind our bench. It's my mom, it's my dad, it's my sister. I always find them every, before every game, and it just brings you back in. When you look up and you see everyone, like hundreds of thousands of fans. But then once I find those three, then I said, okay, I'm locked in. I'm ready to go. That's I awesome. like it. That's awesome. Well, speaking of practice, what's the energy been like at practice so far around the team this year? Has it been different from last year to this year? It's been a lot, a lot more energy this year than last year in the sense that everyone's on the same page. And every, we have a, when you have a, when someone has a why, then especially it, that's dangerous. But when a team has a why, when a team is on a mission, we're on a mission this year. I can't speak on what that mission is now, and I'll let you guys see it in the fall. But <laughs> We're, let's just we're on a mission to accomplish some great things and bring glory back to our own football. Well, speaking of mission, I mean, what's what's your what's your not the team maybe? What's your expectations for the season? Can you see your guys bowling at the end of this year? I can't give I can't give predictions. You know, can't, <laughs> Rose Bowl or bust, baby. On, Rose man. Bowl or bust. I can't give predictions, but for myself, <laughs> it's just be better than I was last year. Because my freshman year, I was good. Sophomore year, I got better. So just keep building. Just keep building on what my previous performance was because like my mom always says you're only as good as your last is your last punt right so right. my last punt last year against Rutgers was down at the two no one remembers that right but because if I shake the first punt of this season that's all everyone's going to remember so right 
Right. All right, man. Well, we got into your your goals. I let's hear more about your interest outside of football. I hear you're into martial arts. Tell fans a little bit maybe <laughs> how you think this improves your kicking performance and why you're you're carrying this along. So when everyone asks me and they ask why did you get into kicking, I always everyone just assumes oh you played soccer and ha- that had a huge part to do with it. But where my true kicking abilities, what I'd say, came from martial arts, and I stopped doing martial arts my Right before I came, it was the May of my senior year of high school is when I stopped. I'm a second degree black belt. I don't like telling people a lot because it's one of those things that you just like you just keep in the like just that you know you are. You don't have to walk around telling everyone, oh, I'm a second degree black belt. And in fact, they said it during the game when we played Rutgers, and everyone was like, You're a second degree black belt? I was like, Yeah. <laughs> and they're like, Well, that's that's cool. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, I Kepa Mar- Kepa was a martial arts was a big part of my life because when my when we were three years old, my sister was already in dancing school, and it's kind of that age where before sports, no, you don't really get into soccer yet or or basketball. So my I needed something to do. So we just found karate as just this this outsource, and then it became such a huge part of my life from when I was three years old until I was eighteen. And I still carry the teachings with me today, and I made relationships that will last a lifetime during that time. Yeah, it gives you a good base, teaches you a lot of discipline as well. So it's it's definitely a good thing for sure. So you are, after all, a student athlete. You did mention you're in the business program, but tell people about your major and what your post-grad plans are with that. So I'm a finance major. Uh, My plans after college actually, as of now, have nothing to do with business. It's the NFL and then after the NFL. (laughs) (laughs) I mean – I mean, when you get to this level, everyone kind of has that dream, right? You've been chasing it since you were a little kid playing in the backyard. So when you get to the end, when we have we have people always ask us, oh, do you want to go to the NFL? If you say no, then why are you here? Because right. obviously you've been chasing this dream for so long that you get to the Division One Big Ten level, which is the best conference in college football. How do you just now say, okay, I'm like, I'm, I'm good here. You can, you can never just say I'm good here. You're always hungry for more. So obviously that's the dream, but – my actual dream is to coach football. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. All right. Nice. Mm-hmm. Do you see yourself coming back to Maryland as a potential coach down the road? Is that something I mean, you'd be open to? Everyone has to start as a GA, right? As right. You start, as you get, start as a GA and then probably go back down to the high school level and make your way back up. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. So we've talked a lot about the pandemic and whatnot as well. So what's a, a pre-pandemic Maryland pastime you miss and hope to get back to soon? Is there anything mm-hmm. that stands out to you? I'd have to say the biggest thing is just being around people, not even on the team, but just like regular, like my friends that I don't really get to see much because especially during the season, we were just, it was Monday through Friday, it was practice Saturday game. Then you went home to your apartment and then you really didn't do much. So just being able to go out with my friends after a game and just hang out and just relax, which we don't really get to do much. Now it's now you have to think, okay, how many, like, is it going to be a lot of people? Uh, have they been vaccinated? It's just there's a lot of there's a lot of outsourced things that you, you you have to worry about before you actually go out and just hang out with your friends, which used to just be commonplace. Now it's one of those things where you're like, Do, is this okay? Can I do this? Right. Is this okay? So it's, it's just, just not, getting not back having, to a sense of normal, not having the hesitation to do something. It's right. Something. Makes a lot of sense. Well, listen, this this has been a lot of fun, man. We appreciate you taking the time. But before we end, we always offer our guests a chance to plug anything that you want to talk about, maybe anything that we missed here, and let the people know where to follow you on all your social media. Uh, so my Instagram is ant underscore peck 98. Uh, my Twitter is ant underscore peck 21. And then I ask everyone to go follow. It's called Healthy Minds, and it has four underscores after. I know it's confusing, but apparently Healthy Minds is a popular name. So it's Healthy Minds with four score underscores after after it and i have to give a shout out to my nana who i love dearly she's in uh she actually just got her second shot she's home in florida i have to give a shout out i have to give a shout to my uncles and aunts all over the country i love them all i have to give a shout out to my mom marissa my dad anthony and my best friend my sister alessia that's awesome man it's awesome appreciate you taking the time man hopefully we can do this again if not in season after the season we'd love to talk to you again sounds good thanks for having me Appreciate it. Well, he was an easy kid to talk to. A lot of fun having Anthony on the show. Can't thank him enough for taking the time. Yeah, thank you, Anthony, for being on. A lot of fun. I also want to thank uh, Dustin Semenovic, the assistant AD. We had to line up all this through. 
Thank you for being patient with us. Uh, we got <laughs> off on the wrong foot, apparently stepping on some rules with the Dino Tomlin interview years ago. But we've <laughs> patiently waited and learned uh, the ways. And uh, we're hopefully we'll be a long future interacting. Yeah, man. Just, again, <clears throat> all the candidness, the open conversation. There's a lot to Anthony that, uh, you know, me, it, it's – it's good to see players be as transparent as, as Anthony was, you know what I mean? They, they, to talk a little bit about his family life, to talk about obviously his struggles with mental health and just all of that. Uh, it, it speaks volumes to him and who his character is. It's really fun to know, get to know these kids. I mean, I've continued my conversations with Ellis over the, the last year <laughs> since that interview, it's right. been really good to have somebody that well connected and interested and, you know, just such a good guy to, to bounce things off of. You know, me and Marty have been talking like it's it's been really an unknown benefit that this has created. I didn't see this coming when we started this podcast. Yeah, I totally agree. Well, hopefully all of you fans out there liked it. Let us know. Uh, send us an email. Send us something on Twitter, on our social media. You can follow me at Fred BLBS. Follow Ryan at Terps B. Espert. Follow the show at Shell and Tell Pod. If you want us to send an email in or and give us a question maybe for our next guest, uh, or just be a part of the show, shellandtellpod at gmail.com. Ryan, sign us off. All right. Well, we got an on-paper sell out of this spring game. We got no tickets left, so I want to see butts in those seats. That's right. I can't wait to get back in the stadium, and I hope you can't too. Until next time, here's to wishing all is well under the shell.